It's fall. May the forest be with you. Coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, we received a note from a listener and a viewer that, well, it kind of sparked a conversation. The note was, I've made so many mistakes through the years, and I always find that I'm never satisfied with the placement of my perennials and shrubs. I'm wondering what mistakes the two of you have made, if any. <laughs> have you made any mistakes? I mean, this is only an hour show. <laughs> 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 and let me tell this person that you are not alone. And by the way, placement is a challenge for almost everyone and mistakes happen. And Stacy, everyone's made a placement mistake with a plant. Oh, literally everybody. And, you know, I, before I worked as a rooftop gardener, I thought that the designer I worked for had it all figured out and he had everything worked out to within a fraction of an inch and we would show up on the job site and it would just, you know, go like clockwork. And that was not the case at all. You know, first we go to the nursery and it's like, oh, wait, no, I want this instead. Oh, I'm going to switch this out and now I'm going to get these and they don't have this. So now we're going to do these. So already the plan is not scratch wrapped but you know mm -hmm. so then we get on the job site and then it's all you know like by feel and it's like changing things around and moving things around even people with plans aren't locked into their plans they don't follow them to a t um because it's just gardening is is an art and a science yeah i agree i operate by the seed of my plants that's what i do and a lot of people do it uh, i think it was ben franklin too who said eh do it tomorrow you've made enough mistakes for today <laughs> now actually he didn't say that and the historians in our audience would correct me but it does uh, make sense i mean when life shuts a door, open it again. That's how doors work. And that's how we work in the garden and we make mistakes. So we'll take a few minutes here to talk about some of the mistakes that we've made. And I learned very early uh, running a garden center. There was a day when I asked a young man to go out front and plant the annuals in the flower beds. And I was aghast when I got out there. He was working quickly, he had half the job done. But he had planted all the annuals roots up. Oh, dear me. It never occurred to me to tell him the roots go in the soil and the flowers face the sun. Well, that is, uh, yep. When I was in horticulture school, I know one of my first days on rotation at the display gardens at New York Botanical Garden, one of the gardeners took me on the little golf cart, put me in front of this massive container, had a couple of flats of like pansies. It was springtime. So it was like a bunch of random spring stuff. And she said, okay, now plant it. I'll be back in, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she came back and I had planted like, you know, six pansies in it. And she said, well, what the heck are you doing? I said, well, I was following the spacing instructions. She's like, no, nah, no, nah. let me show you how it's done. <laughs> and so we pulled those things out and she's smashing the root balls and jamming stuff in. And, uh, you know, that wasn't really a mistake, but that was a similar thing. You, you learn, you learn by doing. Yeah, exactly. You learn and you learn from experience. You know, I was also thinking working in the industry, uh, and this probably explains a lot, okay? I have, and true story, I have fallen off the roof of a barn. Ouch. I have fallen off a greenhouse. Are you okay? <laughs> and I have fallen out of a tree with a running chainsaw and walked away from all three episodes. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. I did. Well, I mean, it's crazy. And, and so then I sit here and I think about it. You know, I'm getting to my mid-60s and I think about it as a kid. I was a kid in the 60s. Okay, in the morning, my mom would kick me out of the house and you spent the day trying to figure out what you were going to do that day. Uh, we didn't wear seat belts. We didn't wear sunscreen. We didn't wear bike helmets. We drank from the garden hose all day and we survived it. So far. It's amazing. So far. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I've made mistakes with clay soil, being out in the garden way too early and then actually seeing landscape timbers and boots and other material just sucked up by that soupy Oof. clay. You know, you get anxious and you get out there too early in spring. I've been out there way too early. 
Oh, yeah. And I think a lot of people, and we talked about this, I think, last spring, people get really excited about starting their seeds, and they're, I'm going to start the lettuce indoors. I'm not going to read those instructions that say direct sow parsley seed. I'm just going to do it now. How bad can it be? And, you know, you you do find out. There's no harm in it, really, but you do find out that those things are definitely going to be much happier if you follow those directions. They were almost certainly written by someone who knows what they're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, of course, getting back to the question of our listener and whether or not we make mistakes. Yes, of course, we make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. One suggestion that I would have, and we talked about plant placement, is that with plants, what I like to do in fall is in fall, I start dreaming about what next year's garden is going to look like. And in the process, in fall and early spring, there are plants that you dig up. There's plants that you move. There's plants that are too big for this certain area. A great thing to do, and I do it every year, is I take pictures Mm. in fall. And I make sure to save those pictures. And then in the dead of winter, as the snow is coming down and you can't be out there in the landscape, you can begin to do your strategizing, determine what mistakes you made in the past year, and uh, be better for it. You know, it's such a good strategy because the garden in spring, everything's coming up. It looks so nice and tidy and small. And then by midsummer, you're like, holy macaroni, what was I thinking? And then in fall, you're like, okay, next year I'm going to do better. And then if you're not getting those pictures, it's probably not going to happen because you forget. Exactly. So uh, just a suggestion for you. And oh, hey, by the way, also getting back to the falling out of a tree with a chainsaw. Oof, yeah. When you're young, you're invincible and you're stupid. Oh, you at least think you're invincible. You're (laughs) stupid. And I was stupid. And uh, now all of my work is done by certified arborists. I would never do something like that. Never encourage anybody to do something like that. I remember on one of my properties, uh, we had to cut down a very large cottonwood tree. And uh, I thought I was doing it right. And as the tree uh, started to lean, it was leaning towards my neighbor's garage. Oh, dear. And I drove my 1976 Monte Carlo out there, hooked up a rope to the tree and to the bumper of my Monte Carlo. I pulled the bumper off my my 1976 Monte Carlo. I loved that car. Did you get the bumper put back on? Oh, yeah. Okay. (laughs) I'm much wiser now in... uh, in my older age, because you just, you do some of the, the dumbest things. I mean, one minute you're young, fun and invincible. The next you're turning down the radio in your car so you can see better. I'm at that stage. (laughs) I mean, I do feel like there's some people joke about that a lot, but there's some truth. It's hard to concentrate when there's a lot of, you know, noise and everything. So it's not like, oh, I can see better, but you can concentrate on what you're doing. So I, I have done that my whole life. So and I'm a bit younger than you, so now another, you're in good company. Another mistake that I make, and I'm sure you make this one too, is I get so anxious in spring, I plant out annuals or tender plants too early. I jump the gun, and then maybe I cover them on cold or frosty nights, but all you got to do is miss one night, and Elvis has left the building. Well, yeah, and if they don't die, they do get severely set yeah. back. They are not Stunted. equipped to deal with cold weather at all. Um, I'm, I'm lucky I don't have that problem because I do my annual shopping with my mom sometime in May when it's already kind of, you know, past. So I, I don't have that temptation to go out there and get stuff and say, oh, it'll probably be fine. I'll roll the dice and we probably won't have a frost because that never happens really. So Stacy, you know, I'm the canna king. And uh, one mistake I made a couple of years ago was I stored the cannas in fall. I was impatient. I didn't allow them to dry and cure properly, put them in storage wet even had a tarp over top of them to keep them nice and warm. (laughs) Super dumb mistake. Following spring, all of those rhizomes were just mush rot. Right. When you said super dumb mistake, I thought you were going to say soup, as in that's what the can has turned into (laughs) after you did that. It was a can of soup. That's what it was. And I had to dump them all. So, you know, Stacey, the point is we've all made a mistake or two or more. And the great thing about making mistakes is that uh, we learn from them. You know, they always say you learn, uh, you learn by the mistakes of others. And, and many times own. I find myself being the other. 
<laughs> you definitely learn from your own mistakes as well. So, yeah. and you know, when people say, oh, you know, I love listening to you and Rick, you're both so knowledgeable, you know, the knowledge that we share on the show, some of it we've learned in books and plant tags and so forth, but honestly, most of it we've learned by doing, we've learned by being gardeners and working with plants. And that is the best way that you learn. And if you want to become a garden expert, you don't do that in a textbook. You do it by getting in the dirt and, and seeing it firsthand. Exactly. Sometimes the school of knocks, hard knocks, some knocks worse than others. <laughs> knock, knock joke coming on. Forget it. Let's go to, <laughs> let's go to plants on trial here on the gardening simplified show. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, I do love talking about mistakes because the mistakes that I have made in the garden are the things that definitely stick with me the most. Mm -hmm. And probably my earliest mistake was cutting back lavender in, in the garden that I had when I was in college, thinking, oh, this thing looks terrible. Got to cut it back, and there went my lavender. Sure. But I never have cut back lavender since, so, you know, and... Um, some mistakes lead to a vendetta. Do you have any horticultural vendettas from your mistakes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. So when I was in horticulture school, we had a plant <laughs> ID exam and I got one plant wrong. And uh, I, I pride myself on my plant identification plant. skills. Adriana can tell you I'm, I'm a very good. I'm very good at plant identification. So I pride myself on those skills. I got one plant wrong and it was um, Agapodium podagrarica. The horrendous plant known as gout weed or oh, yeah. bishop's weed. Awful. An awful plant to begin with, but now I hate it even more. And I can't even look at that invasive thing without becoming, you know, a little bit enraged on my, you know, 25 year old <laughs> behalf. It's good you're getting this out. <laughs> Take me to your weeder. That's good. And, you know, when, it's funny being part of a plant brand. Like, obviously, we don't want people to make mistakes. Sure. We want to give people everything they need to be successful when they buy one of our plants. Um, and that can be a little bit difficult when you specialize in hydrangeas. Sure. Because people love hydrangeas and they are, you know, without question, one of the the pro most problematic plants because they are a little bit difficult to understand. And I think if it comes to one single plant in the garden and landscape that people consistently make mistakes on, I'd say hydrangea macrophylla, big leaf hydrangea, this is the kind with the big pink, purple, or blue flowers, is a, is a contender for at least the top three. I agree. And people live in fear of making pruning mistakes. And, you know, because, yeah, it's very disappointing when mm -hmm. you've made a pruning mistake and the thing doesn't bloom. It's even more disappointing when you didn't make a pruning mistake and it still doesn't bloom. Ah, and frustrating. That, and, that's, and that does happen. So there's two reasons why big leaf hydrangeas are so prone to people making mistakes. One of them, of course, is that they bloom on old wood. So that basically means they have flower buds for the next year or the current year pretty much all year long. Basically, they start making their flower buds for the following season in August. So flower buds are on that plant all the way until it flowers the following, you know, June or July. And that opens up a very wide opportunity for, you know, improper pruning um, for deer or rabbits to munch on the plants for cold, winter cold or spring frost to nip those buds. And the second reason, and this one I do take very personally, is because those plants look for all the world like you've got to cut them back in winter. Exactly. I was just going to say that. They're so beautiful, and then they reach that point, people feel like, i got to do something. Or I know I'm supposed to do something, but what do I do? They look at it, and they think, that looks horrendous yeah. and probably dead, and so I'm going to cut it. It's like they dare you to cut them Correct. back. Correct. I swear. And I've done it. I've cut them back, too, because they just really look like they should be cut back. So when, when we're looking at developing new hydrangeas, we want hydrangeas that are going to resolve these mistakes, that are going to be almost, if you will, mistake-proof. Mm -hmm. Not to say you can't learn from them, but we want you to be successful. You know, sometimes maybe you don't want to devote your life to learning about when big leaf hydrangeas set their flower buds and when you should prune them and this, that, and the other. And the, the answer to that is you should avoid pruning them if you can. Um, and so, you know, we want to make it easy for people. And so I wanted to cover for today's Plants on Trial our 
best hydrangea, our best big leaf hydrangea for people who are just like, you know what? I'm done. I just want something that performs. I don't want to learn when it blooms. I don't want to learn how to prune it. I just want to put something in the ground and have something that blooms every single year. And that hydrangea is Let's Dance Can Do Hydrangea. A beauty. It is a beauty. And so you're probably wondering like, okay, well, what makes this one so different? And you have seen, uh, you know, over the past years, you've been coming here to to visit Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. We have a big line of Let's Dance Can Do hydrangeas right outside our office. And I have been watching those develop over five years and they truly are extraordinary. So there's two things that, that make them extraordinary and, and mistake proof, if you will. The first one is that they have better flower bud hardiness. So like I just said, they have flower buds on them basically August until the following July when they start to actually open their flowers. So those flower buds being present on the plant during cold weather are very susceptible to cold damage. They could get frosted, um, zapped just because the temperatures do in fact dip so low. Um, Of course, deer can be an issue. And so the the flower buds... uh, are better able to withstand the cold weather. They can take more cold without getting zapped like older varieties would. So that's one factor that we're always looking for. So we want that better cold tolerance. And then the second factor has to do with this pruning, whether you prune it accidentally because you think, oh gosh, this thing looks terrible. I've got to cut it back or a deer pruned it for you or a, uh, and I hear from this all the time, a well-meaning child who's home from college and thinks they're going to help you with your fall cleanup. Landscapers very often don't know, you know, they just, they're, they do the whole mow, blow and go and they don't know. They just think I gotta, gotta do the fall cleanup, better not leave anything standing. So there's a lot of ways that things can be cut back, even if you know better. So Let's Dance Can Do Hydrangea sets its flower buds along the entire length of its stem. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, except when you find out that big, most big leaf hydrangeas, conventional big leaf hydrangeas, only set their flower buds at the tippy top. So if they were getting, you know, if, if they were getting uh, frozen off, if they were nipped by deer, if they were cut off, there goes the flower buds. Whereas if they set it along the entire stem and there's something left, there are still flower buds even way down there towards the ground to flower. And that's what Let's Dance Can Do does. And, you know, I this is it's kind of hard to like really explain what this translates to in the performance of the plant until you see it yourself. And I knew all this, you know, before we introduced it. Megan Matai, who's been on the show, our plant yeah. breeder, said, oh, this is so extraordinary. And I was like, okay, yeah, whatever. Until I actually saw it in front of my own desk here at the office over this time. And I have seen, now I don't recommend that you do this, but I have seen it every single March, the grounds crews come through and they chop those things down. And the first time we were all sitting at our desk going, oh my gosh, what are they doing? They're not going to flower. And in June, they were covered in flowers like nothing ever happened. So again, we don't necessarily recommend that you don't do the right thing, but if the right thing is not done, you're still going to get flowers. And that is pretty extraordinary. When it comes to big leaf hydrangeas, uh, you essentially, with this introduction, took a problem and you nipped it in the bud. We did nip it in the bud, but yeah. not, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm trying to think if that's literally or figurative, but we nipped it in the bud. You did. You just have to get <laughs> Let's Dance Can Do Hydrangea and, and see it for yourself yeah, because awesome. it is a seeing is believing kind of plant. Now, it is, uh, a lot of its genetics are a mix of big leaf hydrangea, hydrangea macrophylla, and mountain hydrangea, hydrangea serrata. So that's where that better cold tolerance comes from. Another thing that comes from that hydrangea serrata or mountain hydrangea parentage is that the flowers are lace cap. So instead of being those big, full, round flowers that everybody loves, they are more flat and open. Um, And not everybody loves that particular look. I quite like it because I like more of a natural kind of look. And this is closer to what hydrangeas do in the wild. It also attracts pollinators, which mop heads typically don't because all of the good stuff, all the pollen and nectar and everything's hidden deep within the flower. So it is a mop head. But you know what? If you're Again, if you're tired of hydrangeas not performing for you, I honestly can say Let's Dance Can Do Hydrangea has absolutely amazed me. Um, And I think our breeding team did an incredible job. So I love mountain serrata hydrangeas. Tough stuff would be one, right? So you're essentially saying a tough stuff or a mountain serrata was packaged with a conventional big leaf hydrangea and now they benefit 
from yeah so uh, so we had an exchange genetics? of genes yep yeah so the hydrangea serrata contributed that that increased cold hardiness okay and then this ability to set flower buds down the entire length of the stem that came from the big leaf hydrangeas Brilliant. so there's certain varieties of big leaf hydrangea that had that quality we identified them we started breeding with them and refining and selecting specifically for that so Fantastic. again great plants aren't just made they don't just happen and you say hey there's a great looking plant oh wow it happens to perform well you know we set out with a very specific goal for a high performance hydrangea, uh, almost mistake proof hydrangea. I want to say almost because there's so many factors, of course, when it comes to gardening. Um, I didn't even get a chance to talk about growing it, but it has all the same, you know, care recommendations. And of course, we'll put those on our website at gardening simplified on air.com. But I really do highly recommend Let's Dance Can Do Hydrangea. Now, I do just want to say, seeing as right now it is uh, mid October. Um, if you live in a cold climate where they're fine for cold climates, we actually sell them as hardy to zone four, one of the very few hydrangeas that actually is. If you live in zone four or five, I would probably wait till spring to plant it. But if you live in zone six or warmer and you can get your hands on one, it's a great time to do that. Otherwise, put it on your planting list for spring. If you need a list of garden centers near you that sell our plants, just go to provenwinnerscolorchoice.com or, of course, gardening simplified on air.com. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we're opening up that garden mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, I could have gone on a lot longer about Let's Dance Can Do Hydrangea. Which is great. Uh, it's such a cool plant. It's and awesome. Um, Adriana just reminded me, seeing as it is fall, it also has great fall color, which a lot of hydrangeas don't have. So it's still blooming right now. It's absolutely covered in pink flowers here at the office in West Michigan. Um, and then the flower, the foliage turns purple. So you have those really pink flowers with dark purple foliage. Uh, it's a really, really great plant. So, um, again, check it out at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. And while you're there, if you have a gardening question, you can send that to us. There's a contact form there, or you can email us, help at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. I know it's that time of year where people are trying to uh, tie up a lot of loose ends in the garden, wondering, should I do this? Should I do that? Shouldn't I do this? Remember what we said on our last show, when in doubt, don't prune. So keep that in mind. And with that, let's open up the mailbag and see what people are asking. All right, Stacy Kelly writes to us last week, the shrub on trial was the lemony lace elderberry. That's a favorite of mine. In July, I planted two of them in part sun. When I planted them, I surrounded the root ball with topsoil, which contained organic matter with peat moss. Within a couple of weeks, they both had severely wilted leaves, even though I had watered them twice a week. One has completely died. Any ideas why? Oh, I have an idea why. Yeah, I do too. So, um, you know, I, I understand it's it, it makes so much sense to people when they're planting something new that they want to make the perfect little home for it. And they think that what that perfect little home looks like is a hole filled with nice, soft soil that the roots are going to be able to grow into easily. And you can't be blamed for thinking that. However, it is definitely not the best thing to do. Um, because what happens is called the bathtub effect. And I have explained this to so many gardeners. And um, I think it's, it's one of those mistakes that you make. And when you understand this, it kind of all clicks into place. But basically what happens is that amendment that you added, the, the potting mix or topsoil or whatever you added, holds a lot of water. It's light, it's fluffy, it has big, big air spaces between the soil particles. So it can hold a lot of water. Compared to the soil around it, your natural soil, which this does tend to happen most often to gardeners who have clay because they think, oh, the roots will never be able to go Sorry. into that clay. And this effect is so, so exacerbated in clay soil situations. Um, and so that clay soil has very, very tiny uh, spaces between its particles. So you've applied a bunch of water, that hole just absorbed it all up, and now gravity's going to take its toll. It's going to drain out and down. And it's kind of like a, a crowd trying to rush through a tiny door. Um, and so because it can't all get out at once, it can't drain naturally, that water ends up sitting around the roots and leading to root rot. So I've seen this happen so many times. Some plants are far more susceptible to it than others. Panicle hydrangeas and lilacs come to mind. I have so, so many gardeners who have killed their panicle hydrangeas and lilacs doing this. So we generally do not recommend that you amend the soil when you plant. If you insist on amending the soil, and there are those out there, um, then you should try to thoroughly mix it with your natural soil till they're almost indistinguishable before you plant. You don't want to have that bathtub of, you know, 
the outside of your natural soil, and then the soft stuff inside. Well, Kelly, I'm in the amendment camp. I like to use soil amendments, uh, but I agree with Stacy 100%. Worst thing you can do is create a bathtub. So that's why I always mention to people, think about the roots extending out into the soil profile. If you're going to use amendments, just mix it in 50-50 with the parent plant in the surrounding area. But those were uh, well-spoken words, uh, Stacy. Uh, don't create the bathtub. You're going to kill a plant. Right. And, you know, uh, Lebanese lace is a Sambucus racemosa or native red elderberry. And they can actually take some wet soil. But the difference is when they're getting established, they don't yet have right. the root system to help them through that. So don't necessarily think that just because a plant can withstand wet soil, that's the best conditions for it while it's getting established. So if someone has already done this and they're seeing this happen, then what I recommend is that you gently remove the plant, thoroughly mix that amendment in, and then replant, and it should be able to recover. Good advice. Kate writes to us, my Hawaiian sunset hibiscus has something all over the stems and branches. What is it? It's a total loss. Treatable, or should I cut it back and start over? Well, you know, it is October, and they call this spooky season, and this photo is not for the faint of heart, wouldn't it's you yikes. agree? It's <laughs> Oh, it's yikes. It's yikes. So we'll put uh, Kate's photo of her hibiscus on the website so you can see it, and what you will see there is a, a hibiscus stem that is completely covered with fluffy white stuff. Yes. Very fluffy, very white, and very covered. We see this on tropical hibiscus. Yes, and uh, this is a tropical hibiscus, we okay. should clarify, yeah. Yeah, and I refer to it as snowy scale. This one has a very bad case. Uh, and then you throw into the mix uh, some mealy bug. And of course, with tropical hibiscus, I also find aphids to be a problem in season. And Stacy, you had mentioned to me that this listener was from down south. Yes. So uh, she is somewhere in southern Georgia. Okay. And so the plant isn't in the landscape. It does look like it's in a container. Mm -hmm. um, but it is indeed hibiscus snowy scale. And um, scales are fascinating insects. I find them just utterly fascinating. They're a little bit gross, but also very interesting. So basically what happens is that the insect, the female insects settle down, hunker down on the plant. They, they have their babies. The babies are called crawlers. They crawl out from under the mom. They settle down on a new place on the plant or a neighboring plant. They hunker down. Build a bunker. Build a bunker. They have babies. Those babies crawl out. And so it's very easy to get this infestation that completely covers the plant. And there's soft scales, which are relatively easy to treat. And there's armored scales. And this is an armored scale, which sounds so metal, but in fact is just the fact that they, they make a hard shell that make them very difficult to treat. In fact, when I was looking up uh, snowy scale and hibiscus, it says the family constitutes one of the most successful groups of plant parasitic arthropods and includes some of the most damaging and unmanageable pests of perennial crops and ornamentals. Yeah, and I believe it because to try and get on top of the problem, you would have to spray during the crawler stage. And yeah. when is the crawler stage and how quickly does that happen? You know, it's just too much work. If, for me, Stacy, uh, if the problem hasn't gotten too far, I like to use horticultural oils or at least try horticultural oils because of that armor that mm -hmm. you talked about. Yeah, and so, uh, yes, if you're going to use a regular pesticide that's actually going to kill the crawlers, you do need to time it exactly perfectly. And that time could be so short that you could actually miss it. Um, oil, horticultural oil, is a much better choice. And what that does is it completely coats the insect's spiracles or their breathing holes, and so they suffocate, which sounds cruel, but if, when, you see, when you see Kate's picture, you'll understand why. Um, so a good coating of oil will do it. But honestly, I would say unless this plant has sentimental value to you um, or is going to be difficult to remove in some way, I would uh, not salvage it. I would move on. Yeah, I would too. Uh, at least at that stage, I would do that. And I'm glad I had my pen handy because every week I learned from you, Stacy. And to, uh, today I learned spiracles. Yes. I had never heard that Yeah, that's word how insects before. breathe. Spiracles. I like that. So um, the good thing though, Kate, is that the hibiscus snowy scale is specific to tropical hibiscus. So you don't need to worry about it going on to any other plants unless they are also tropical hibiscus. Yes. 
All right. Uh, Mary writes to us, do you have a suggestion for the best app that identifies wildflowers and other plants? Thanks. Yeah, I thought this was a really good question. Great question. So I um, asked around at work here for some different people and what they recommended. And the pretty much unanimous recommendation was Google Lens. Okay. And so Google Lens is an app, but if you have an Android phone, it's pretty much already on your phone. You can just take a picture of something and then uh, it will actually give you the option to search in Google Lens. And what that does is basically uh, resources all of the photographs on Google for a close match and gives you all of those results so you can match it yourself. Now, this is going to work better if something is more distinctive. You know, if it's just kind of like a regular green leaf, you might see, you might get a lot of results that are sure. difficult to decipher. But sure. if you have something like an oak leaf or, you know, I was experimenting with a beautiful uh, Rebecca that was growing, I found growing in my neighborhood, um, Henry Eilers. Do you know that variety? It has beautiful quilled petals, very distinctive. And then it was immediately like, oh yeah, that's Henry Eilers, uh, Rebecca. But even if you have an iPhone, you can download Google Lens as an app. Or iPhones kind of have their own version of this. So if you go into your photos, if it's a photo of a plant or an animal or something like this, and you look down at the bottom, there's a little eye in a circle and has two little stars on it. If that appears and you click it, it will say, look up plant, animal, whatever. And then it will give you the examples that it might potentially be the potential matches right there in your photo app. So you don't even have to get kicked over to the internet. That's great. And there are many other great apps also, and many of them are free, which is great. If you're asking why someone would use a free plant identification app is like asking, why would you use a free search engine? I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah, and I, so it's a great thing. And I noticed that in some areas they're doing bio blitzes for kids. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt, but they oh. use the app and identify as many plants as they can. That's a fun idea. And then yeah. I did want to mention one other one. I have not used this myself, but a lot of gardeners have talked about it. It's called Right Plants. And it's specifically for gardeners because not only is it going to identify the plant for you, it will give you information about growing it. Great. Uh, so if you're looking not just for what you find in the wild, but for how you can add stuff to your garden, Right Plants uh, is an app worth looking into. We've got to take a little break. When we come back, guess what? The Birdman is back. He's in studio. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And boy, do we have a great episode for you today. He flew in, not under the cover of darkness. It's broad daylight as we record the Birdman, Bill Stovall. Bill is, uh, has been a friend of mine for many, many years. And of course, I know, Stacy, you just love birds and it's migration season. So what a great time to talk about birds. It's always a good time to talk about birds, but especially during a migration season. So welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you, Rick. Great to be here. Hey, let me start off with loons. You brought along a loon on the table here. Beautiful. Not a real one for our listeners. Not a real <laughs> one for our listeners, but on YouTube, uh, you can see uh, this loon. These are wood carvings, correct? Correct. I have a friend that is a master carver, and he carved not only that, but these two uh, beautiful wood ducks, and they're great replicas. Uh, the loons are a fantastic bird. Uh, the southernmost ones are in uh, Berry County, Michigan, but all up north, uh, we've developed a group called the uh, Loon Watchers, and uh, I'm a loon ranger. <laughs> <laughs> it means I'm, an, I'm responsible for putting out the uh, platforms and the buoys to keep uh, boaters away from the, them when they nest. And the birds are very gregarious. They'll come up quite close to your boat because they're so confident being good swimmers. Mm. And, uh, mm. But they protect their, their young quite uh, aggressively. That's fantastic. Now, as gardeners and people who love plants and flowering shrubs and that sort of thing, let's start here. Uh, adding flowering shrubs to your landscape or various plants, uh, Stacy, those berries, especially during migration season as they need to eat and stay fueled up, uh, important to landscape for wildlife. Yeah, and you know, the fruit, of course, is important. Everyone associates fall with fruit, but flowers as well, because many birds are insect eaters. And if you still have flowers blooming, that's going to attract insects. A lot of the flowers that I grow are in seed right now. So goldfinches, migrating, you know, all sorts of things are just going bananas, fighting each other over the seed crop in my garden right now. That answers the question about why so many birds are not at feeders right now, because nature has blessed uh, the ground with all kinds of feed. And, yeah, that's true. Uh, and, I mean, there's no better natural weed control, right, None. than than birds. Than, <laughs> or insect control. Yeah. 
that's why it's good to feed birds all year round because they'll be there if they're nesting. They'll be there feeding their babies insects because you can't feed a baby a seed. That's true. I never thought about that. Even now in October, the uh, birds like hummingbirds are very, very active, at least at my house yet. Are they still active for you? So as we've had some warmer days, they've come back. But I had a couple when it got a little cooler and cloudier, they kind of disappeared. But I'm keeping my feeders stocked just in case those uh, slow pokes are, are on their way down south and a little hungry. And mine are completely gone. I haven't seen them for three weeks. Oh, really? And what's happening, they're accumulating uh, flocks. And uh, because you guys are over here by the edge of the lake, they use that as a guide to fly south. Uh -huh. And I'm more in the center of the state, so they're uh, coming over to meet with a group. Well, that's really good to know because I know I've seen in a lot of birding groups on Facebook that people get really concerned when some people are like, I haven't seen a hummingbird in weeks. And others are like, well, geez, I still have them. And then they think, oh, is something wrong? Did they die? Did they get hurt? So it's good to know that where you're located will impact how late you're going to see hummingbirds. And hummingbirds understand what they're doing. That's, that's true, but <laughs> we should give them a little more credit. We don't, we don't have a problem with population. Uh, it's the distribution thing that it makes the questions. I have a question about hummingbirds. Sure. So I it, it appears that the males leave sooner than the females, at least towards this. Now, in spring, I seem to see males first and then females. And in fall, I've had females, but I haven't seen a male in probably about six weeks. Is that normal? I, or do the I, males migrate earlier? I don't know about that. I hadn't uh, observed that. I think it makes sense. I know that the males come back first right. to uh, capture the territory uh, and then and draw. The, uh, a lot of birds, a lot of the males come back. Some even stay here because they want to keep the best spots. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if the females are chasing them away because by about August, none of the females in my yard are letting a male get anywhere close to my feeders <laughs> or plants at all. <laughs> Competition for food. <laughs> exactly. There was an article in the uh, Smithsonian Magazine about migration, speaking of hummingbirds and other birds or waterfowl, and it was fascinating. Uh, we're going to put the link on the website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Uh, I had fun reading this article, and I think you will too. Uh, in Europe in the 1800s, naturalists could not explain how local birds disappeared during the winter. And then in a German village in 1822, there were a number of birds that showed up with a thin spear through their neck, and they determined, well, they were in Africa during the cold weather and, uh, and were shot at. They had a number of theories. And then if you fast forward, uh, many people would use the moon at night because a lot of the migration takes place at night and use the, uh, the moon to capture the silhouettes and determine what species of bird was mm. flying south. Fast forward to, to, to uh, today, artificial intelligence being used by Cornell University and Birdwatch. Fascinating, Stacy, And they've, they've gotten to the point where they can give people a three-day warning so that uh, lights are turned off mm -hmm. because that's a big problem in cities. Uh, during migration, they lose birds that way. Right. They, they can't find their way with the, with the light. So. And this is a big season for waterfowl, right? For exactly migration? right. Yeah, they're, they're getting ready to go south. They can't feed well through the ice, so they have to get to uh, where there is no ice. That's the whole concept of the migration in the first place, to get to the, where the food sources are on a consistent basis so they can make it to the next year. And that's why we tend to have seed-eating uh, birds that persist through winter because they can find food, whereas insectivorous birds and waterfowl, ice, no bugs around can be a problem, except for woodpeckers. Well, we like, like woodpeckers a lot. <laughs> I love woodpeckers. You don't want to get me started. I love them. <laughs> Bill, you've often mentioned that it's important to provide water in winter. Winter, uh, birds can find, the, the seed-eating birds uh, that come to your feeders can find food. They're mobile. They can find that easily. Frozen water makes a real problem. So a heated bird bath is, is a lifesaver for a lot of the birds. And many times uh, we'll get reports of a, a flock, a small group of bluebirds, males, uh, in, the, in a watering, uh, in a bird bath in the winter, right in the well, middle of the winter. And is that a startling shot? <laughs> hey, you know what? You need a little good luck even in the winter, right? Yes, you do. <laughs> so I'm curious. Now, you, with Stovall Wood Products, you make bird feeders and bird houses. Correct. And I think that there are a lot of misconceptions and confusion about birdhouses. Um, because, you know, they've kind of, a lot of birdhouses out there are strictly decorative. 
Correct. And, you know, people just say, oh, well, I put out this, you know, cutesy little bird feeder I got at the Hallmark shop and I never got any birds. So guess I'm not putting up any more birdhouses. Um, but you make birdhouses that birds will actually use. There are about 84 species of birds out of the many, many ones that are cavity dwellers. And they're the ones that use the houses. And a birdhouse is actually just a hole in a rotten tree. But by putting the right sized entrance hole, you restrict larger birds from disturbing the smaller birds. And that's uh, how that works. Uh, a lot of the ones that are decorative don't have any care about the thickness of the wood and the, and the size of the hole. They just want it to be pretty. And those don't work well. So can you give us some tips about choosing the right birdhouse in the first place? The most universal birdhouse has a one and a half inch entrance hole, which is the same size as a downy woodpecker. Pecker. That's the reason we had cavity dwelling birds other than woodpeckers for all these years. Mm -hmm. Now we're able to supplement that with uh, good birdhouses with a one, ten, one and a half inch uh, entrance hole. But that's just the right size for nuthatches and titmice and chickadees and a uh, whole, uh, whole raft of smaller birds. And that's most of, the, of your nesting birds. The others, the larger birds are uh, specific to a house, like a wood duck. They mm -hmm. need a specific size hole. Uh, and for that, you, uh, there just aren't enough big trees, big dead trees. Owls have the same problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, how do you know, now when you're talking about those bigger birds, like a wood duck or an owl, no, those are going to want a home much higher up in a tree than something like a wren or a chickadee, no? Height has less to do with it than location. Uh, as long as the wind isn't blowing dr directly into the entrance hole and it's well above, uh, let's say, six, eight, ten feet, that's high enough for most mm. birds because nature doesn't have any uh, decision about where to put their hole sure. in a tree. Uh, <laughs> the reason that you see holes in the top of the trees, that's where the bugs are. Ah, that makes sense. Interesting. We're chatting with Bill Stovall. He is the bird man here in the studio. And, you know, you mentioned the decorative birdhouses that you see around, especially during spring. Uh, I have found that they really do not have, many of them do not have a means of cleaning out the birdhouse. Now, that's been a frustration for me in the landscape because I never know when should I get in that birdhouse and clean it out or should I even be messing around in their house? In the spring is a good time to, uh, March is a good time to go check that birdhouse, open it up and see if, if a birdhouse doesn't have an, uh, a way to clean it out, it's not gonna be functional. Mm -hmm. But uh, at that point, you may have uh, things left over from mice or things from the, from the winter. Uh, during the season, uh, it's probably best unless you're going to be monitoring those birdhouses on a regular basis to just leave them alone. And often when you check it in, the, in, the, in March, you'll see there are three different nests in there. There'll be a bluebird nest first and then a, a chickadee nest second and then a wren nest third. So uh, three different species of birds have been in the same house. In the winter, it's good to have the nest in there because they use it for roosting. Because if you have an empty house, their body temperature has to heat up the whole house. But if the house is half full of a uh, nest, oh. then they, and many birds, you get two or three or four birds going to the same bird house if it's really, really cold. Oh, interesting. I didn't think about that. Roosting That's is really important for uh, uh, birds up here that are surviving the cold oh. weather. I just can't resist cleaning the house because you <laughs> see them loading that thing. They're putting cigarette butts in there and, and uh, dryer lint and all kinds of stuff uh, to pack their house. And it just seems like there should be some house cleaning at some point. I watched Mrs. Wren take sticks out of a house that I'd forgotten to clean. And I watched her put new sticks back in. So she <laughs> changed the furniture around to suit her. They're not going to be... <laughs> they Set don't aside. need me, in other words. <laughs> oh, they love to see you. <laughs> Keep your hands off. <laughs> so now it's it's October. When is the best time to put out a birdhouse? Every day. <laughs> Any, so it's never Any too day. late. Never too late. Uh, birds will start to look for them. They're always interested in what's going on. They're watching you. They're watching you in the garden. They're watching you in the forest. And when a new thing comes out, they'll check it out. And then they'll mark it on their calendar for when they return. Some of them will stay there. Some of them will use it for roosting during the winter. 
but uh, in the middle of the summer is not a bad time. Whenever you have a chance to put out a birdhouse, it's going to be a positive. There's no, uh, in the spring, of course, we think about it, mm-hmm. and we put a lot more out at that point in time. And then we capture that whole season's uh, input of, of birds. But any time is a good time. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's particularly important for the big, uh, big houses, like the owl houses and the wood duck houses, uh, to get those up in the, in the fall. Because they come back about in the first part of April, and you're not going to be wanting slipping and sliding up in a tree in April. <laughs> That's true. Now, um, is it does it matter if a birdhouse is affixed firmly to a tree or if it's hanging? Uh, I'll tell you this in confidence. Okay. Wrens are swingers. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the bird population likes them to be stable. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, that's really, I mean, wrens are delightful to have yeah. around. So, so that's good to know. If you want wrens, so, so does this mean, I know sometimes there's an issue of like European sparrows or starlings or something getting into nests and causing problems. If you have a, a free hanging nest like that, does that exclude some of those problematic birds? Not really. Oh. The, the one you're the one you're uh, seeing most often are the sparrows because they have the same size entrance hole mm-hmm. as the universal size. The starlings you need a larger entrance, so they they don't they're not as invasive. No, that's good. But sparrows are a real nuisance, and uh, <clears throat> other birds have to fight off the sparrows. And there's a chance where you can get busy, Rick, because if you see a sparrow in your house, keep an eye on them, and as soon as they fill that up, take it out. And as soon as they fill it up again, take it out. And what they'll do, they'll give up. And then the bluebirds or the uh, tree swallows can use that house. Oh. So you have to be persistent. Be be persistent. And and Rick is. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Swallows are fascinating. And we're so lucky living by the lakeshore to have so, so many to watch. Yeah, I mean, so many birds here along the lakeshore. Again, for our viewers and our listeners, we're broadcasting from West Michigan. Bill, is is it because we have so much water around here that we're blessed with so many different species of birds? I think it has water as one as one part of it, but the habitat that we have along all this wetlands and all these uh, shorelands and all these streams that we have in southwest Michigan just make a natural habitat. Habitat's the way you keep birds and have birds, having good food, good good cover, good nesting areas. Uh, that's why we have a population like we do. Yeah. We've got uh, areas of treetops where we have lots of warblers. It's just, it's just a bonanza of places for birds. But you know what, and I've been thinking a lot lately about that concept of habitat and what that means for a gardener and for gardening, because anytime you plant something, you are creating habitat. And the choices that you make of the plants that you put in the, in the ground in your garden are what determines what's going to take up residence in your yard. And with good decisions, you can make your yard much more hospitable for birds that we actually want to see and birds that need that extra help. If you can get dogwoods and wonderberry and a, a lot of the understory shrubbery, uh, if you can get uh, perennials that uh, seed like uh, oh, coneflower and uh, black-eyed Susan and several of the others, you're developing a nice seed base. Uh, and as long as uh, crab apples, all of those things are excellent. And, and the, uh, the birds will help you if you just... Uh, uh, let them drop the seeds around in your in your woodland and let them grow. Let the volunteers show up. Uh, we have an amazing number of, of uh, I only had a couple of winterberries once upon a time. Now I've got lots of them. Oh, that must be beautiful. Yep. You know, when I travel, I, uh, I put a note in my phone and I know when I'm going to go to the airport and hit the road. Now with these birds, we're talking about habitat. They do migrate. Is it because the days are getting shorter? Is it because the food is less available? Uh, what causes a bird, obviously not a calendar, but what causes a bird to say, I'm going to hit the road. I'm leaving this habitat and uh, see you later. I'm going to vacation down south. I think there have been a lot of studies, but uh, a lot of it's light. When the light is at a certain position, then they get itchy and they uh, start to make for the south. Hmm. And that tells them that the uh, flowers are not going to bloom as vigorously or they're going to be losing their leaves. They're not going to be producing berries. So it, it relates to the vegetables and, and, you know, the natural habitat. And light ha- has a great influence on that. So th- I think they're all tied together. 
See, I'm hoping this year, again, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it's an El Nino winter <laughs> and that they decide, more of them decide to stick around this year. I mean, some t- you do have winters where some birds stick around longer, right? That happens all the time. We yeah. have more geese than we would like to have because they <laughs> decided they could stick around. <laughs> but there are a lot of birds that we didn't uh, used to have. That we, we see more robins now. Yeah. Yeah. We see more bluebirds that are wintering over now. And not only the, the males, we're seeing a few of the females staying. And uh, they do it for a couple reasons. One is they're selfish. They want their old habitat back. They want their old house back but they also can survive on a lot of the berries and the, the water, and they can eat little vegetables along the edges of, when there's snow, you can see them uh, right along a stream side, mm. eating bits of grass or leaves or stuff. They're pretty incredible birds. And of course, more people are feeding. Oh, yeah. You know, bird feeding sure. has become quite popular, so that also helps. Does that help or does that hurt? Does that confuse things? I think it helps considerably because they have a, they have a, a place they can go that they can depend on food, and then they can they eat food from around the surrounding area. So you're reducing your, your insect population by uh, having feeders out. Mm. Uh, but bluebirds don't really eat seeds. Right. So they eat mealworms and things like that. So that's a s- specific kind of feeding. But suet, a lot of people put out suet and mm-hmm. has, you know, mealworms and that kind of thing in it. But uh, bluebirds like the water. But uh. they, they find... Everything they, they find everything in nature that they need. They, you don't have to supplement that too much, other than if you want to see them, get right. them started on mealworms, and then go see people that <laughs> sell mealworms, because we love them. I don't want to duck the question. Ha! Ducks. Ha! Ducks. They're going to stick around up north. They head south. Tell me about ducks, because I love ducks. Well, ducks migrate, and they migrate uh, in great flocks, and that's the time when the duck hunters have the best time along in their duck blinds, and the black labs go out and splash around in their puddles. And uh, But this is a great time to see them along the shorelines and the, and the uh, little, little lakes and ponds that you find because they'll come in, in flocks, and, at, and then they imprint to a particular place for a very good time, two, three, four weeks, and you can see them every night coming in. Uh, we have that, uh, not only the ducks, we have wood ducks coming in on a, a lot of them. We have mallards coming in a lot of them. Um, but we have sandhill cranes, mm. huge quantities of sandhill cranes for, for this region come in. And they come back every night. Now, I was in uh, Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago. And there's northern Wisconsin, Green Bay. And some sandhill cranes landed in a park. And they were about as close as me to you, and they were not the least bit phased by us. Is that typical behavior? They can be acclimated by people. Uh, that happens in Florida all the time. Oh. They'll walk right up to you and knock on your window for some popcorn. <laughs> but it's not as the healthiest thing for the bird. No. And they've got a kind of a pointy beak. You know, they could stick you pretty easy. <laughs> so I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I try didn't try pe- to feed them yeah, or anything, them. but I was quite quite surprised because I feel like every other time I'd encountered one that was very far away, or I was driving on the highway, or something like that, and it was like, oh my gosh! Like I thought they were sculptures at first because they were so close. Well, we don't hunt them anymore. We did it a long time ago, uh, and some states do hunt them, but they found they're very difficult because they're very bright birds. They're one. Mm-hmm. Of, well, cranes are the oldest, or one of the oldest birds in the universe. Loons are the other that. Oh. That those two birds really? uh, evolved uh, the longest ago. Mm. Uh, but if you if a man shows up in a field with a stick in his hand, the lo- the uh, sandhill cranes are going to be long gone. Mm. Maybe after the second shot, <laughs> <laughs> but they're not going to be around. They're they're real. They, they're, they leave they're... fast. But they uh, the ones you've seen must uh, be in. They may have been in, in park areas up north where they were fed. Yeah, it was, a, it was a city park. I mean, they didn't seem to be looking for food, but they just seemed completely unfazed by the fact that we were, you know, 10 feet away. Talking about parks up north, years ago, we used to see mute swans all over the place. Mm. Not anymore. No, it, I've never As, seen one, and I go bird watching almost every weekend. But since my friend Joe Johnson planted uh, uh, trumpeter swans, in southwest Michigan, we have uh, several hundred pairs. Oh, right. they're all, and that's our native swan. Right. Sorry, I got those confused. Yeah. No. So now we only have mute swans because they were released in. The, oh, we only have. Wait. Now I'm confused. <laughs> we, uh, the mute swans are the ones with the yellow bill. Okay. Yes. And they're the ones that were brought over from Europe. Yes. As decorative birds, 
and they made a mess. Yeah. And now the Department of Natural Resources and, and, uh, and Trumper swans have pretty much eliminated them. Mm. So it's uh, our native bird, the trumpeter swan, is the one that's uh, around all the time. And uh -oh. A lot of them. And they're doing a really great job of reproducing and growing. That's good to hear. For uh, a moment of color commentary, Birdman, uh, a few weeks ago, quite a stir was created when some flamingos got off track and ended up in Lake Michigan. I mean, how often does that happen? I picture a hurricane coming along and they get blown off course. Now, of course, uh, with migration and because a lot of birds migrate at night, again, big cities, lights, buildings, that type of thing can become a real problem and the birds become disoriented. But from time to time, we learn of a disoriented bird. Had you ever heard of flamingos in Lake Michigan before? That is, that's a real oddity. It hadn't happened, and I, in reading the literature, it may not happen again. But flamingos eat shrimp. Mm. We don't have shrimp in Lake Michigan. <laughs> we have crayfish. They better learn how to eat a crayfish. Watch their little bills. They can get takeout at the Red Lobster. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they can. I hadn't thought of the Red Lobster. Do they have little chips, or what are they? How do they pay? <laughs> Well, Amazing. you know, if people had seen flamingos, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, no one would have believed them. Right. <laughs> they would have thought they were hallucinating or something. <laughs> and thank goodness people were able to get photographic proof because it's it seems totally improbable. Well, it's, a, it's a strange. It's just absolutely strange that they come up here. Uh, they probably saw the water when they were flying, and, but they, they need to stay down south. Well, yeah. hopefully they made it back safely. Maybe it was a hurricane. Yeah, they that's what those. they say. Bill, how important is it to teach kids about birds and watching birds, caring for birds, paying attention? Uh, how important is that to you? Why is that important? Well, I think we all need some serenity. And one of the most important things about bird watching is seeing who is at your feeder or who is in your yard and identifying them by name, same with shrubbery and trees, and that's how you get a base of the conservation of the, of the country. And with birds, uh, they're a primary indicator. It's like the, the uh, canary in a cave, in a mine. Oh my, yeah. uh, but when a population is decreasing, that means there's a change in the habitat. And we don't know that unless people keep track of them. And our next generation are the ones that are going to have to do it. Uh, we're doing more banding now. Uh, we're getting more information. You mentioned the uh, uh, AI possibilities of, of nighttime. We're learning more about it. And if we can stop some, uh, the changing of the habitat or make sure that habitat is available for some of the birds that are in trouble, but the only way that we're going to know is teach the children about nature, all kinds of it. Go for a walk. Get your feet wet. Turn over a rock. Find something. Just get outdoors. If you've got to go to trout fishing, look up in the sky and see, the, see the, <laughs> what's going on around you. I go trout fishing, not so much to catch fish, just to be there. <laughs> Sometimes that's what it's all about. Yep. Stacy, you love bird watching. Why do you love it so much? I mean, I, I it's a lot of what Bill just said. I love seeing the interactions of birds and their habitat. And, you know, the thing that's so fun about it is it's never the same day twice. You really never know when it comes to birds. They're so mobile you really never know what you're going to encounter. And I found that birding is a lot like gardening in that um, once you start looking, you see more and more and more. And the world just expands in a way that you didn't know was even there when you first started looking. Yeah, that's great. That's well, great. you're both professionals in all kinds of areas. But the more you know about birding, the more you know you don't know. That's it's <laughs> just incredible. How that's much absolutely is out true there. of gardening too. <laughs> I don't know if I'd look at myself as a professional. I kind of wing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he is the bird man, Bill Stovall. And Bill, thanks for joining us on the Gardening Simplified Show. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Oh, today. my pleasure. Hope to help with the education of this stuff. Oh, and Stacy, always fun to do this show. This is great. It is. And, you know, if you're looking for a birdhouse that will actually get birds taking up residence, you can find Stovall Wood products online or at your local bird bird store. <laughs> there, there are many, many brick and mortar stores around the country. Uh, my distributor in St. Louis area has 4,000 out there around oh, the United wow. States. Oh, wow. And the ones in Wisconsin, there's uh, they cover with salesmen eight states. 
and uh, the people out of Grand Rapids have five warehouses. So there's lots of them out there. <laughs> so, but this is really about education rather than uh, and and keeping the birds safe and having places for them to have uh, have a safe life. Bill, we're going to let you fly off to your next destination. Stacy, it's been fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks, Adriana, and thanks to all of you for listening. 